I'm Eugene Spafford at Purdue University, and I'm going to talk about the role of professionalism, about staying informed and current. This is a talk about the ethics of software development, where ethics involves choices, and the choices have impact. I'll start by talking about some notable software flaws that we've had over the last few decades. And there are many to choose from, but some of the notable ones. In 1998, NASA lost the Mars Orbiter, a $230 million loss of the entire mission because of a program conversion of units in the software in the design and operation of the orbiter. In 1994, Intel had a $425 million loss when software that had been used to design their Pentium chip resulted in an error in the floating divide operation, and they had to recall and replace chips worldwide. It was a big embarrassment for the company as well as an expense. In 2012, Knight Capital, an investment company, had losses of $440 million because of an automated trading system that had a software flaw in it. It not only lost $440 million, but Within a year, the company folded because of the losses. It actually destroyed a company and its jobs. It's not only a matter of destroying a company. In 1994, a Chinook helicopter crashed in Scotland, killing 29 people. And an analysis after the fact showed that it was a software error in the flight control for the helicopter that caused it to crash. In 2000, at least 21 people were killed by an overdose of radiation from a radiation therapy machine that uh, resulted in, um, or that was caused by improper settings in the radiation setting because of software. These are people who actually died. And we're using software more and more in systems now that can affect people's lives, self-driving vehicles, and there's even talk about autonomous weapon systems. Now, those examples came from prior years, and you might think, well, things have improved since then. And no, they haven't. We had some very notable software failures in 2021. You may remember the Colonial Pipeline, which, because of ransomware, shut off fuel deliveries up and down the eastern seaboard. It caused a panic because gasoline wasn't available. And that was caused by program failures that allowed ransomware to get established, but also because of program failures that they didn't understand the consequences for their system, and so they had to shut it down as a precaution because they didn't know what it would do. Tesla, the automobile manufacturer, had to recall 12,000 cars because of a programming error that could cause them to crash. Banks worldwide were shut down because of a uh, software error in a uh, network protection system leaving them vulnerable to outside attacks. So they had to shut down and it caused a panic for people who could no longer access their accounts. And in the UK, the National Health Service had to shut down for a day because of programming problems with their database system. And this also had the incidental effect of shutting down travel on trains, airlines, uh, the Metro and others, because people needed to show their COVID certificates that were being held by the National Health Service which they couldn't access. These are all examples of software problems, and they're quite prevalent in the area of cybercrime. Cybercrime results in huge losses. In 2022, it's anticipated that there will be $6 trillion in losses from criminal activity to government and private business. Over half of those are traceable to errors in the software. Poor software quality in general causes another $2 trillion a year in losses because of crashes, flaws in calculation, um, wasted time, and other kinds of problems. That's significant. In 2022, we're talking $8 trillion in losses. Security losses alone 
are expected to reach over $10 trillion by 2025. In 2021, one measure of the number of problems is the number of entries into the CVE, the Common Vulnerabilities and Exploits list, uh, that is maintained by MITRE Corporation. There were 20,168 flaws reported that were entered into the database as distinct problems in 2021. And those were simply the ones that were detected and reported. The problem is huge and growing. Why? Well, the problem isn't the software. The problem isn't the computers. The problem is people. It's the people who design the software and code it. It's the people who install the software, who maintain it, who operate it. It's people who market the software for things that it isn't supposed to be used for. All of this is a result of bad designs. And the bad designs are in part because of lack of care or lack of knowledge. The people who write this code either don't care that it has problems or don't understand what the problems might be that they're creating. It's also caused by poor maintenance and uh, poor design decisions about deployment. Too often, priority is given to developing new software rather than maintaining and correcting existing software. We have a large untrained workforce in this field, and it's a failure to consider the outcomes because those people don't understand what the outcomes are and are very often under great pressure to get things done faster, quicker, and with less overhead. That's because there's a rush to market. The idea that things have to be out on the market as quickly as possible rather than as safe as possible. The Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that in the U.S. alone, there are 500,000 open positions for computing specialists. These are people who program and operate computing software. As a result, there is a push to train people to take positions, but the training is often minimal. People will take a weekend crash course in how to program, or they may teach themselves how to program from a book like C++ for Dummies. And as a result, they know how to program, but they really don't understand software or software development. Meanwhile, the employers are eager to hire these people because they can hire them at low cost. They don't necessarily care about the training. They just want to fill seats to produce software. But this leaves out the whole notion of a professional rather than somebody who can simply hack code. A professional is somebody who's had education in the field, who understands about careful design and how to use good tools, who understands how to test software appropriately to make sure that it works and it's fit for purpose. Somebody who's involved in continual learning because the field changes on a regular basis. A professional is someone who understands their own limits because not everyone can be an expert in every component of software development. So understanding what they can do properly and what they can't is part of being a professional. Overall, holding to a high standard is professionalism. And not enough of the people in the field currently are professionals. I'll share with you a view from ACM. ACM is the world's oldest and largest professional computing organization. It is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with nearly 100,000 members around the world, over 50% of whom are in the US, but the rest are in other countries uh, all over the globe. Most of them are professionals, but about a quarter of them are students. And it's about evenly balanced between people who are in the profession uh, out in industry and government and those who are in research positions at universities. They estimate to reach over 3 million uh, additional members because of their placement in their various positions. In 2018, the ACM conducted a major rework of their Code of Professional Ethics. And in this rework, they received input from uh, several hundred people around the world. The result was a code that has 25 precepts in four sections that includes a introductory prologue, an interpretation section, 
and additional guidance on how to apply those rules. There are seven general ethical principles, nine professional responsibilities, seven professional leadership precepts, and two for compliance with the code. Several of these apply directly to the notion of professionalism and maintaining good software. And I'm going to step through these just briefly to give a sense of what's involved. In the general ethical principles, one of the preeminent ones is to avoid harm. The idea that as a professional, we're in a position where we can affect others. We should avoid harm where possible. And that means anticipating harm and doing what we can to avoid it. As part of professional practice, we should strive to achieve high quality in both the processes and products of professional work. High quality means think about design, study, be ready to employ good practice, and to argue for appropriate practice with those who are doing the development. 2.2 in professional practice says to maintain high standards of professional competence, conduct, and ethical practice. This again explicitly says that we should retain our competence, continue to learn, that we should conduct ourselves as professionals and be ethical in what we do. That is to make choices that adhere to good practice of professional conduct. 2.5 says to give comprehensive and thorough evaluations of computer systems and their impacts, including analysis of possible risks. So when we're asked to produce something, we should actually consider not only the strong points and talk about the strong points and what it will do, but we should also document and discuss where are the weak points? What could go wrong? How could harm result? We should present a balanced view of anything that we produce. Precept 2.6 says perform work only in areas of competence. Here, it's important that we understand what it is we know how to do and know how to do well. That also means understanding what we don't know how to do, and we shouldn't take on tasks that we're not able to do well. This is a problem with novices who've only just learned to program because they have no idea what else is in the field and don't understand what they're unable to do. And as a result, they may not be able to only work in their areas of competence professionals do. 2.9 says to design and implement systems that are robustly and usably secure. This explicitly calls on professionals to think about the security of what they produce and to ensure that what they do provides safeguards and mechanisms against its misuse by others. 3.1 says to ensure that the public good is the central concern during all professional computing work. This is important. This is to think about the context of what we're doing. How is our software likely to be used or may be used? How will it affect the public at large? We should think beyond simply meeting a deadline or filling an, a requirement currently, but thinking in the bigger picture of how is this software going to have a longer range impact? And are we producing software that's going to be for the public good rather than uh, somehow ending up harming the public? And then last of all, reinforcing this, is the precept to recognize and take special care of systems that become integrated into the infrastructure of society. As I mentioned earlier, software is being used now pretty much everywhere. We're using it in utilities to run water systems, power systems, run the communication network. We're using it in transportation. We're using it in factories. We're using it in healthcare and banking. It's important that all of these systems work appropriately, that they work safely and that they work securely because they have a severe potential impact on the public. And that includes all of us. Everyone makes a difference. Each of you can choose that the difference you make is one that improves life for others. That's choices, and ethics is about choices. The easiest choice, or the choice that pays the most, is not always the best one. So choose wisely.